Yeah, so I went to school at Sea Boulder. I was really interested in physiology and neuroscience, so I got my majors there. And then I ended up um, continuing into a one-year master's program through the Applied Biomechanics Lab there. Loved what I was doing, loved working with the people, and realized that like maybe academic research wasn't my end-all, be-all, and so kind of shifted more towards the clinical work um, and ended up getting lucky, getting a job out here in San Diego. So I picked up and moved across the country, and now I'm a clinical research coordinator. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpri. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpri's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe bomb today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today is somebody I've been wanting to talk to, at least for this sport, uh, referred by Melissa Mazzo back on episode 52 with Dan and Melissa. She's a competitive powerlifter and is a clinical research coordinator at the Geneva Foundation in the Gate Lab. Um, she is a graduate from CU Boulder. Technically an integrated physiology, but she worked in the applied biomechanics lab. I'm sure she'll tell us more about that. Um, if that wasn't enough, she's also a powerlifting and strength coach for Bullseye Strength and Barbell Medicine. Welcome to the show, Claire Zai. Hi, thank you. I'm glad I got through the mouthful. I, I always love people that have a mouthful for me to say, but I'm always worried I'm going to like stumble over it. <laughs> you did great. It sounds awesome. Thanks. Thanks. And thanks for having a relatively easy name to pronounce. I'm. It's another thing I try my best, and anybody who's listened to the show for a while knows every once in a while I just like stumble over myself as I'm trying to say names, and I try to be respectful, but I'm like, please have an easier name for me. <laughs> I always tell people it's uh, Claire's Eye, like apple pie. So that usually works. sticks pretty well. So. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll we'll start off with this so we don't get too far You've got to give a disclaimer, and then I'll ask you why here in a minute. Yeah, so none of the following podcast is the or represents the views of the Navy, the DOD, or the government, um, and all of the views and opinions that are said here are my own. Or my own in this case. Correct, yes. <laughs> Although I but, have no affiliation with the uh, Navy Department of Defense or uh, any of the other ones you mm -hmm. listed. So, um, so. Exactly why do you have to give the disclaimer? Because that doesn't come yeah. up very often with the show. Yeah. So I um, uh, I work in a biomechanics lab out of the Navy. I work at the Naval Hospital here in San Diego. Um, and so what we do is as a group, there's like eight of us, six to eight of us, depending on the time of year. We evaluate persons with amputation or traumatic limb injury and help to rehabilitate them back into whatever activities they want to do, whether that's running or lifting or um, whether they want to return to duty or not. So that's why the disclaimer. <laughs> it, it's always interesting to me just like how, how much I don't know. Like, I know that sounds simplistic, but just like things you don't even think about not knowing, you know, like to me, you don't even almost... know what you don't know. Right. Yeah, right. it's because on the surface, it just seems like we're chatting like whatever you say, it's just you. But then there's all kinds of like legal games that get played that I'm not even aware of. So then you have to give the disclaimer just to like clear up any is <laughs> any issues that might arise. Um, so so how do you get into doing what you do for work, at least in this capacity? Yeah, so I went to school at Sea Boulder. I was really interested in physiology and neuroscience. So I got my majors there. And then I ended up um, continuing into a one-year master's program through the Applied Biomechanics Lab there. Loved what I was doing, loved working with the people, and realized that like maybe academic research wasn't my end-all, be-all, and so kind of shifted more towards the clinical work um, and ended up 
getting lucky, getting a job out here in San Diego. So I picked up and moved across the country and now I'm a clinical research coordinator and I do lots, of, lots of paperwork. Actually, I ended up doing more paperwork, but it's okay. I still you, work with some cool people. Do you get hands on? Like, are you, are you more shuffling papers or are you more hands on? It depends on the project. So we okay. have about 12 to 13 projects going at one time. Um, but they're not all like recruiting or active. Um, and some of them are like 10 year studies. And so our 10 year studies, we're doing like gate biomechanics in the lab. So that's when you have infrared cameras everywhere and reflective marker dots. And you're like measuring joint angles and power and work and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that kind of stuff I'm not as involved in. I'm doing more um, like clinical research on my side. So I do right now I'm doing a phone interview study to like the end up uh, the end of the study. The goal is to create this uh, questionnaire. So when patients come into a clinic or like if you've gone to a doctor's office, you know, you have like those questionnaires you have to fill out. Mm -hmm. We're trying to standardize it for persons with amputation and traumatic limb injury. So that's I end up talking on the phone with a lot of people and interviewing them doing that. So that's my more clinical side. And then we have one where I was very hands-on where I was, um, I was tripping people who were missing limbs, which sounds really mean, <laughs> sounds awful. Um, but, uh, yeah, my coworkers like to tease me that I'm very mean to our patients, but they'd come into the lab and we were trying to, we were trying to come up with a way to rehabilitate more quickly. And so we were, tripping them on this treadmill to see that if they could get used to these trips and these falls, because mm -hmm. that's a at-risk population, right. if we could get them um, rehabilitated faster. So yes and no is the short of that long answer. And this is kind of maybe a nerdy question of me, but like, how do you standardize a questionnaire for people missing various limbs? I, I guess on, on the surface, you could say, uh, well, we only have four limbs that you could be missing. But at the same time, it seems like it, you still would have like sub classifications of like below the knee, above the knee, whole leg, two le like like and, and you could have like there's obviously a finite number of variations, but it still seems like a you know pretty large data set to try to have just one questionnaire. It it's a very large data set, so we have to have about six hundred and fifty people, or that's our like recruitment goal, mm -hmm. and so. We have to ask a lot of questions. We also end up asking 300 questions in these interviews. So mm -hmm. they're very long interviews. We'll do them over multiple years to get all of the data to see how those change over time. And so the goal is to be able to see how the like patient reported outcomes track with physical outcomes. So how people feel about how they're doing versus how people are actually doing um, in the eyes of the provider. So the goal is to make it we can shorten the test by doing this. We can create um, computer adaptive tests mm -hmm. and those tests allow us to like, they like, have you ever done like in an old magazine, you can do those like tree questionnaires and it's like uh, leads you down a certain path. So mm -hmm. this just like cuts off half the questions if they don't apply to you. So right. all 300 questions are going to be in this computer adaptive test, but it knows like, oh, you answered this way so we can just skip some of these questions and it right. ends up taking two to five minutes instead of when you go to a doctor's office it can take you 15 minutes to fill out forms mm -hmm. so it just drastically cuts the time in half and it makes it easier to track that progress like i said over time and see how they progress through their care so okay so i mean it's, it, it... I guess that makes a little more sense. You're making like a flow chart and it's like, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it, you're not going to, if somebody's missing, like, you know, like I have a below the knee amputation and you have questions about like missing a hand, like you're clearly not going to be asking them questions. It doesn't apply. So you want some way to skip that. Correct. And we know that like people who are missing, um, they have a below knee amputation. They, probably aren't going to have the same challenges cooking as someone who is um, missing a hand. So those kinds of differences are just 
not included or like you can automatically say, oh, I have a low problem or very little problem doing these activities and that's okay. And you just continue on or they're not asked. So, but yeah, we have to have a very large sample size. So we cover, we get a lot of people with a lot of different kinds of amputations. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so I guess the sum up version is like, you're trying to improve uh, patient care and like long-term um, positive outcomes for people with amputations, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I know somebody who went to college with the uh, intention of trying to change uh, healthcare for the better, mm -hmm. which obviously is a very large, it's um, quite a lofty goal. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And uh, they kind of feel stuck. Do you feel like what you're doing it, it makes you know some of that impact? <laughs> um, yes and no. It the impact that I really see in healthcare is more on the like person to person level. Mm -hmm. So like between a provider and a patient, or like our lab is so small and we work very closely with our patients. We have we have these like hour long one on one interactions with them, or it's more like six on one um, interactions with them that allow us to like really provide a good base of care for them and help them get back to these activities they want to. And then we work with the entire physical therapy department of the Navy. Um, we, the whole department meets every other week and we talk about all the patients and help them progress through care. So I think that having that like one-on-one -on -one time is really important. Whereas this study will probably give us more information to help them, but it's not the thing that I'm like, this is what makes healthcare good. Right. So, right. Well, and I, I don't have the expectation that, one person or even one company can really like overhaul <laughs> healthcare, but just it's a, I kind of think about, I guess, humanity, I'll be a little esoteric as a collaborative effort. Like we all, you know, we're like a, we're like a pile of ants basically. And we each have our individual functions and duties and together we can, you know, build mm -hmm. that anthill and change it. Um, but you're not going to have like one ant that builds the entire thing by themselves. Yeah. Yeah. One ant can only carry one grain of sand at a time. Right, right. Yeah. So that, so I didn't mean, I didn't mean to be like, Claire, are you, are you going to overhaul our healthcare system? <laughs> just, just, I mean, like, I'm trying, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the one-on-one -on -one interactions is more of what I think make a big difference. So, but that is also biased by the fact that I want to be a healthcare provider and that's like a path I'm working on mm -hmm. walking down right now myself. So yeah. That also colors my experience. I think I saw um, maybe on your personal coaching site that you were applying to medical school or, or trying to go that direction. Correct. I just finished one application cycle and I got waitlisted. And so I'm reapplying and working on trying to get accepted. So mm -hmm. I'm currently sitting on an active waitlist, hoping for that to come through. Um I look at my phone and check my email a lot, hoping that email <laughs> comes through. Um, but other than that, I'm reapplying, turning around and trying to, I want to be a doctor. So that's, that's the yeah. end all be all. Now, obviously plans ch can change when you get to um, residency, you're doing rotations, all that kind of stuff. But do you have an, in, like an intended uh, field of study or specialty? I don't yet. Um, but I lean kind of, I kind of, flip-flop between a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in internal medicine. I'm interested in family medicine. Um, I want to be able to like develop a, a longer relationship with that patient. And then I also am quite passionate about women's health. Um, mm -hmm. Since you have been digging around on my Instagram, I talk about periods <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Uh, like kind of to the point where people are like, oh my God, stop talking about periods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's just something that I'm really passionate about and I get very frustrated by women being told that they're incapable because of their period for yeah. any reason. And right. so um, I'm also interested in obst obstetrics and gynecology. So I like yeah. women's health. So, well, I mean, it, on the one hand, you may have some people that are like, all right, Claire, like that's enough. Like you can, we've heard <laughs> it, like you could put it aside, but like there, no matter what it is, now obviously this is affects half the population, 
Um, but even if it was a matter of you loved model trains or something like I, I'm trying to think of something very benign, you know, but not <laughs> not super impactful, just mm-hmm. but something like that doesn't really matter. But you're like really into that. Like things need champions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like I, I feel like just continue to toot your horn like you don't like thank just, you i appreciate you know, that. do your thing yeah my uh my powerlifting coach makes fun of me because i say i'm passionate about periods so <laughs> here i am the passionate powerlifter passionate about periods so that's all right that's all right you know what and, and this is um i haven't really talked about this on the podcast before but um i did Originally, so I mentioned before we got going, I majored in math and psychology, and I mentioned that before. I'm an oddball. I don't know. Math and psychology doesn't really, like, fit into anything. Um, but I actually was interested in, um, like, sexual health or, like, sex research at some point. Mm-hmm. Like, I wanted to uh, – originally, I thought maybe I could try to work at the Kinsey Institute. And I kind of came at it from – like, I always said it because I – I said it. I said it with people I would just meet like at college, because um, it's a good gauge. Like, what kind mm-hmm. of person am I, am I talking to, right? Yeah. Um, and you may get that as well. Like, am I actually going to be able to have you know an open, an open, honest conversation, or is it is it going to be like, all right, this is not the kind of person I'm going to connect with? Yeah. Because I came at it from a place of like, I, it's a it's a normal function that happens with the vast majority of the population. But yet, at least culturally, we're so shut off from talking about it. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I, I obviously went a different track, but um, I, I kind of feel like, you, you know, you're maybe in a similar lane where it's like, you know, like, oh, periods are gross. Like, let's don't talk about it, Claire. And you're like, yeah. guys, like, this is normal. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's. Part of it is normalizing that it happens hopefully once a month. That's the goal. It right. sh- for normal health reasons, it should be happening once a month. And um, it does have effects on training and how we feel. And it is impactful in our training in some ways. And in some ways, it's not. And you don't need to worry about it, but you need to be aware. And powerlifting is a male-dominated sport. Mm. There's two men for every woman who's competing, um, and that is uh, a recent change. So it used to be four to one a couple yeah. years ago. 2008, it was four to one, which isn't that long ago. Uh, no. That was only 12 years ago that it was a lot different. And so there's a lot of men who kind of are gatekeepers for the sport. And they mm-hmm. are. Most of the men are coaches. Most of the coaches are men. And um, they're coaching these female athletes. And they maybe don't understand like what a period is or how it works. And so it's also just really important to understand the physiology or even the humanity of the lifter in front of you and the person you're working with. So, and unfortunately that's what we deal with every month, hopefully. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I know, you know, that's one of the things and I haven't really been in a, um, I'll say super official coaching position. Like I haven't been hired by a college or, or built my own practice or anything. Um, but I, de- I know just as an athlete, athlete slash leader, uh, uh, you know, of a collegiate team that, uh, you know, I was mostly in charge of the guys team and the girls teams had their, you know, their team captain and things. But it, it definitely wasn't on my mind as a man. It's not something I deal with, you know, so it's just like do the workout. So mm-hmm. um, I'll give you this chance. Enlighten me. Um, what? Why does it matter? I guess. And I say that lovingly. I don't, you know, mean to just to put yeah. you down. But just, yeah, no, what, not why all. does it matter? What happens? Um, how does it affect you physically, you know, as as a lifter? Yeah. So those are those are all great questions. So um, there are normal hormone fluctuations that happen during a period. Also, I'm not a doctor yet. None of this is medical advice. But <laughs> there are normal hormone fluctuations through a period. Um, and there is some evidence in the literature that shows that there's an effect of estrogen on the muscles and tendons um, and on how we feel. And there's been self-reported outcomes from high-level athletes, not just powerlifters, that they feel changes through the different phases of their cycle. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's also evidence, and 
um, I've read a lot of the evidence on it, and I think it's spotty, and there's some new stuff coming out. There's evidence that right before our periods, we might be a little bit weaker, and right, and like during our periods, so like from the start of menses to ovulation, we might be a little bit stronger. Um, so there might be like this cyclical change, mm-hmm. but um, that's shown in like one joint and two joint muscles. I'm sorry, one joint contractions. So like uh, the bicep curl or right. the like the knee extension. Um, but it's maybe not shown like overall in powerlifting. Mm-hmm. And so we talk about this thing called. So that's why it might matter, but it. Also, there's a lot of stress that's imposed on an athlete or a lifter during any time of training. And so um, we, the group I work with or like the circle of friends that I have who talk about this, we call it allostatic load. And it's just all of the cumulative stress in your life, including like how well are you sleeping? How well are you eating? Um, how's your job, your kids, your work? All of that. How is like how was your drive? to the gym was it stressful or not Mm -hmm. all of that has an impact on how your training goes because we as humans have a limit for stress and um your period is also included in that and there are people who are like you must periodize training based on the period so you have to train heavier when it is your period and lighter when it's not or right before and that's probably not like the biggest contributor to stress in your life during that time period. Mm -hmm. So we want to allow for um, greater increases and decreases in stress based on your entire life and not just base it around this one thing that we use to like define a woman or like that's how society does it. Um, But, or it's just not the best way to measure stress Mm -hmm. because it's not the only thing that stresses women. Right. Or men. People. Right. Yeah. So. So that's why it matters. It doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and and the trouble obviously is trying to much like your study with the amputees, like putting together a study, funding it, finding participants, like getting the data to back up. And then even if you after you've done one study, like it's really better to have multiple studies that can confirm the same outcomes to Mm -hmm. you know get over any potential biases that may have happened within that stuff just science takes a long time science takes a long time and you also have this issue of all of the studies are really small most of them are like 14 or 15 people and women or people and it's then they'll compare it to women who are on birth control and Mm -hmm. not all the birth control is standardized right and that's a whole nother can of worms that i'm trying to dig into of how your birth control affects training. Um, There's a lot more studies on that, so it's going to take a lot longer. But it's... um, Those small studies are a problem because you're more likely to publish the things that are very different because of that, like, small study bias. Mm -hmm. And for those who listen to this podcast who don't know, like, that small study bias is when you have, like, a small study that has a big effect... Um, the difference between the two groups is probably has to be very large to have significance. Whereas that difference might even out if you have more people in the study. And then also we don't study or we don't publish studies that are, that are negative that have no, um, or they prove the null hypothesis that there was no difference. So there's like a bias in the literature towards this like difference and Mm -hmm. it's exciting to talk about. You're like, Oh, we found it. We figured out why women are weaker. And it's like, probably not. There's a lot else, a lot of other things going on (laughs) that um, can limit and keep women from reaching their full potential. Yeah. Of the, of the various researchers I've talked to since I started the show, um, that's one of the like biggest issues I feel like, they've all kind of agreed on is that sample size is always so small, a dozen people, 10 people, 15 people. And it's like you, if you have an outlier physically for whatever reason, genetics training, you know, and you try to control for those things, but just it it allows because of that sample size, you don't get the nice smoothing with large numbers. Like Mm -hmm. I always think about it. 
um, for the lay person, which this is still a little technical, but like I liked to play poker in, mm-hmm. in college. And there are variations in how you play. Even if you play perfectly, sometimes you're going to lose. And the anybody you talk to basically said, you need to play 10,000 hands before you can determine whether you're a good player or a bad player. Because your tendencies over a large number will show what's actually going on versus, you know, you had the best hand and still lost and you thought you did poorly. So the same thing can happen with those small numbers. It's like, yeah, something weird went on with this uh, one person in the study and that threw off all of the results. But then if we add another 10,000 people, it's just a bliss, just you know, a little piece of noise within all of the data that doesn't matter anymore. Exactly. Yeah. And the fact that we'll publish studies that are small and have a significant difference between the two groups, this is obviously a simplification of what research is, but then you don't publish the studies that don't have a significant, mm-hmm. um, significant difference between two groups. Thank yeah. you. Then you're just only publishing half the data. And so for me, when I'm like going through this stuff, I'm like, you have to give me an overwhelming amount of evidence that this is, that there is a difference between two groups. It can't just be one study. It can't just be like one little piece of information. It has to be big enough that we can extrapolate it to the entire population. And we don't have that for periods. So, or for a lot of science. So how do you approach, since, since you actually coach people, both powerlifters and just kind of I'll say general strength although it's more technical than that um you know since you're the champion of this like how do you how do you approach it with your clients that's a that's a great question so we I I don't know who we is I (laughs) (laughs) um and this is true for both the company that I own and the company that I work for um, I use RPE. So RPE mm-hmm. was originally developed for like running and more endurance exercise on a scale of eight to 20, 12 to 20. It, it depends so on weird, uh, depends yeah, on who you talk to. Borg's RPE scale. I've seen it from like, it technically it goes to one, but I'm always like, if you're zero or one, you're dead. So like yeah. it goes to like <laughs> 21 not... or some odd number, but yeah, I don't know it's... what Borg was doing. It's a weird, it is supposed to track with heart rate. We, as like a powerlifting community, uh, this guy named Mike Touchere modified it to be a one through 10 scale. So it's easy to conceptualize a 10 is a one rep or is a, is your max for any rep range. Um, and so we base everything off of RPE. Okay. And so the, your first lift of the day will be anything f- anywhere from a single at like an RPE eight, which means it's difficult, but not like a grinding lift. Like you, if you saw, if you think of like an Olympic lift, um, as they're like coming up out of the hole, they're just like grinding through it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like that. Um, it's like difficult and you feel it, but you're not, you could do two more is technically how we try and conceptualize it. And so you'll either do a single or you'll do like a set of five at like six, seven, and eight, RPE six, seven, and eight. And then um, that controls for whatever is going on in your life. Like some days it'll be really heavy Mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to move as much weight. And some days it'll be really light and you're like, oh, I can go up. I can put more weight on the bar. And this allows for this uh, kind of modular prescription that we're getting within this like target percentage range of your one rep max. So... Usually it's between 75 and 85 percent that we're aiming for, and we're just going to kind of push you on this as long as we can. Um, and then we deload every four or five weeks, and then start over again. Um, and so by letting the lifter dictate within the session how they feel and how they're going to perform each lift, it gives some wiggle room for the days where like you come into the gym and you start, and you're like, I feel great, this is going to go really well, and then it just like tanks or um you come into the gym and like there's a lot of lifters who are like oh i'm hung over and then they end up hitting prs that day and so mm-hmm. it just allows for that um day by day prescription 
um, which encapsulates your period, your stress, um, your job, all of those things, all of that allostatic load that should be included. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of RPE and I talk about that on my kind of running show a fair, a fair amount, just like trying to get people to pay more attention to that. Cause it's like, you can have a plan for the day and say, this is what I'm going to do. But if, you know, you didn't sleep well and, you know, your kids are nagging you and you've got work to get done. You, there's all these other stressors that are going on and you're just, you're just fried. Then maybe doing mile repeats that day is not the best thing. But at the same time, like as an example, I did mile repeats last Friday I did not sleep the, well the night before. I think I had food poisoning. Um, I got up. I have basically have the best set of my season so far. So, like, it doesn't always, you know, correlate that you did or didn't do something well and then feel good or bad. Yeah. And what I like to do is I like to have an athlete come into training, warm up, and then they have something that acts like a like, test to say – okay, are we going to push RPE today or are we going to have to drop it a little bit? And so that's usually the, so if they're doing singles um, for their first set, they'll do a single at six, a single at seven and a single at eight. And the single at seven tells us, do we need to push this one at eight? Like was the single at seven super easy this week? Or did that feel really heavy? And maybe we just need to take a small jump to that, to get to that one at eight. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that acts as a test to say, like, this is how I am in real time feeling today, because probably in the next five minutes, nothing is going to change. Mm -hmm. But from the time you start warming up, things are going to, once your blood gets moving and you feel a little bit better, things might change. So yeah. you can't know until, like, right before you're going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually want to jump back a little bit, because I'm curious how... Like you personally got into powerlifting, you know, it's not, as far as I know, it's not really, um, most schools don't have like a powerlifting program. Like there's lifting classes, you know, like mm -hmm. I took lifting in high school and we did some Olympic lifts, but it wasn't like we were training for competition or anything. Um, so especially sports like powerlifting, I'm like, how do you like, how do you even get, you know, get into it? Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. So <laughs> I also I started lifting in high school, um, just like I was a soccer player and a diver at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so lifting was like a extra thing I did to supplement those sports, and I hated it. I like enjoyed being in the gym, but I was super self conscious. Mm -hmm. um, I've always for those for the people who are listening who've never seen me, I'm short and I am substantial is the best way to describe it. I'm just like a <laughs> thick human. Um, and I've always been that way. Like I've always had big legs. And so I was always really self-conscious about the fact that my legs were getting bigger or I thought they were getting bigger as a 16 year old in high school. Right. Um, and so I ended up continuing to do it. And then I got to college and I ended up quitting soccer. Um, I didn't like the girls who played on the team at my school, so I mm -hmm. didn't do that. And then I started diving and I, or I kept diving and I liked that well enough. And then after about a year, I was like, okay, I don't really want to play sports in college. And then, um, and I ended up being a gym rat. I, it was like the only thing that I was like decently good at and still could do. I'm an awful runner. My legs are too sh short. Um, and I'm built for like sprinting as hard as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, Endurance running wasn't my favorite thing. And I, if I had tried, I could have maybe like gotten better at it, but I just didn't want to. Right. And so I maintained my gym rat status up until my master's year. And during my master's year, I had a friend who was like, hey, you actually have competitive numbers. We should train you for a meet and you should compete because I was still squatting and deadlifting and benching, um, which are the three main powerlifting movements. And mm -hmm. so I signed up for a meet. Um, it was actually in Kansas, so we drove six hours to Kansas. <laughs> I competed, and I just caught the bug, and I haven't stopped since. Um, I love it. Um, so that was two years. That was almost two years ago now that I competed for the first time. Uh, and now I coach and train people and compete at a 
very different level than where I started. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, um, give me an inside of how does a competition run or how does it work? How's it scored? Is it just purely, you know, one rep max or how, how does that work? So for the, for a meet, you usually will show up, um, about, so for the feder, there's a ton of federations. Um, but I'm going to describe how my federation works. Um, okay. it's the biggest federation for powerlifting. So you'll show up about two hours before you're supposed to start lifting. Um, and you'll weigh in, you have to weigh, there's weight classes. So you have to weigh underneath your weight class. So I'm a 72 kilo lifter, which means I weigh about 158 pounds, a little bit less, um, when I weigh in. So I'll weigh in, um, and then I have two hours before I'm supposed to step on to the platform. And so what you do is you have, uh, you start with squats and for squats, you have three attempts. For each of the lifts, you have three attempts. So you'll head out onto the platform. You'll have warmed up during those previous two hours from weigh-ins until um, first lift goes. And then uh, you'll do your first squat. And everyone who's in your flight will go at the same time. Well, like, you go in successive order. And then you'll do your second attempt. And it's all, like, one after another. So you'll do all three of your squats. And then... Usually there's a second flight that will come out who's been warming up while you were lifting. And then you'll go back and you'll warm up for bench in the warm-up room. You'll warm up for bench, you'll come out and you'll do your three bench attempts. And the goal is to like, you start, your first attempt is usually like pretty easy. You could pull or push three of those, that lift three times in a row and it would be fine. So they're all really quick. You just want to get numbers on the board. Um, and then at the end you'll do deadlift, same process. So the goal is for your first attempt, get numbers on the board. Just if you don't get numbers on the board for any of your lifts, you're disqualified. So you have to get numbers on the board and then the goal is to increase them with each attempt. So, uh, that last attempt, attempt number three is usually like a PR, a big number, something you've never hit before. And you've like set yourself up. The goal is to lift more than anyone else in your weight class. Um, so it's all based on weight class for that. Then at the end, they do some fancy calculations to see if you can, if you are technically stronger than people in other weight classes. Mm -hmm. So they, um, control for weight and sex. And usually they will score men and women separately, but mm -hmm. the calculation accounts for that. And then the goal is to be stronger than everyone else. So as like a 158 pound lifter or a 72 kilo lifter, um, there are women who weigh a hundred pounds who deadlift almost as much as I do. So they are technically stronger than I am because right. with more muscle mass, I should be able to move more. Right. Um, but the best deadlifter in the world, who's a, who's a woman, uh, she can pull four times her body weight, which is incredible. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. so is that calculation, do you know, I guess I should say, is that calculation just a straight like power to weight ratio or is it, or is there more to it? There's more to it. It's called a Wilkes formula. That's what they used to use. And they've successively changed it three times in the past year from what they use, but we, we just still call them all Wilkes. So, okay. um, it's a Wilkes formula. It includes some modifiers for, if you just controlled for, uh, weight, there's, they're trying to control for muscle mass, not weight the same way. So there's more going into it than just, uh, just the weight and the pound on the bar or the load on the bar. Yeah. So. Do you see, do you see that? Will that formula skew one way or another? Like does, is it often that like the lighter lifters end up with the better numbers it's actually the middle lifters who end okay. up profiting from that. So um, women's powerlifting goes from like, I think it's, they're so small, I can't even remember the number. It's like 48 kilos all the way up to 84 kilos. Okay. So it's like a big range. And then the 63s and the 72s are the best two um, spots to be in. Unless you're this one girl who can pull four times her body weight, she has the best wilts in the world. So yeah. You never know how it's going to work, but, um, 
And then, yeah, so after all of that has been done, after all of the medals have been awarded, um, they just randomly select lifters who they think might be drug tests, might need drug tests, and then mm-hmm. you have to go pee in a cup. So that's fun, yeah. too. But Yeah, as a, as a random <laughs> sidebar, I always felt um, a little left out because I never was good enough at the national championship to get pulled aside to be drug tested. <laughs> Yeah, it have, is interesting how it's are. always one, two, and three. They're like, yeah, these three people, the top three lifters, we're going to take them. Yeah, that's always... Well, it's, yeah. you see, with, with triathlon, it's not always the top three. Um, and I'm for, like, so episode number three and 29, Todd Buckingham, my friend, he's been national champion and world champion before. He's been drug tested a number of times because um, he's always at the top. But then I know there's, like, even through like 15th place, they've had, they've pulled people just to check. Yeah. And the highest I ever finished was at a national championship was like 50th. Keep in mind, there's like 2000 people, but. Um, I mean, just the fact that you make it to nationals, the national, if it has the word national champion in it somewhere, it's a pretty good accomplishment. I, I suppose, but it, it's just, it's just a, like, it's just a weird thing. I keep in my head where I'm like, I was never drug tested. I, I wish I was good enough to be drug tested. <laughs> it's just this weird like mark of of pride I picked out for no reason at all. <laughs> um, I am wondering about putting on weight though. Um, I I I didn't read it. I saw how got busy today. I saw you had written an article talking about um the factors in body composition and those kind of things. And um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that it takes some time to put on weight and put on muscle like you're not like like right now i'm a little heavy for what i want to be i'm like a little over 170 i'd like to get back down to like 160 um that's going to take a lot of food discipline um you can join me in the 72 kilo weight class <laughs> yeah i'd like to get back down I, I've, I've we can cut together pounds. yeah i've gained 20 pounds since college so yeah somehow i'm putting up similar numbers i, I don't know um <laughs> just beyond me um but i mean it takes time to put on weight right it, you know as a lifter so um is there when you're training people or even doing your your own kind of calculations for yourself are you looking at okay well obviously right now you're kind of in your sweet spot but as you're building are you like i can only gain 10 percent, you know of my body weight in a year or is there any kind of calculation like that that comes into play there is. Um, I know what I like to weigh for like training. So I actually don't weigh 158 pounds right now. Mm-hmm. I weigh 167, 166. And I got up to 170 a couple weeks ago. And then I was like, okay, hold on. I can't keep eating ice cream every night. Um, yeah. <laughs> no matter how much I love it. And that's so my, that's I my problem like, too. So. <laughs> yeah. I don't like cutting more than 10 pounds. Um, yeah. Usually once I get to that point, I'm like, this is starting to be uncomfortable. Like I'm just one, not fun to be around. And two, I don't like having to work this hard. Uh, But there is some people say like, don't cut more than 10% of your body weight. I don't actually like to have lifters cut, especially if they're new. Mm -hmm. Um, Powerlifting or like any sport can be very intense the first time you do it Mm -hmm. and a powerlifting meet is very loud and um because you're all trapped in a room together and everyone's yelling about something whether it's the lifter out front who's lifting and the crowd's yelling at them or there's like 700 people in the back room trying to get lifters warmed up and it's just there's so much else going on that you need to focus on like you don't want to have to worry about weigh-in so just like show up at whatever you weigh and so I don't start worrying about what lifters weigh until we're trying to figure out, one, if they need to lose weight for health concerns, or two, if you need to, like, if you're, like, good enough that it's like, okay, now worrying about this weight cut is actually going to put you at the point where, like, maybe we're getting into nationals, maybe we're looking at winning nationals. Um, so, like, I took a lifter to national. she went to Swedish nationals, Finnish nationals. I don't remember which one I should know, but I was like, do you have goals of like winning nationals? She's like, I'm nowhere close to winning nationals. We're just going to go as we are. And it, it makes it more fun for the lifter. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause lifting is often just about competing with yourself. 
Mm-hmm. It, there are so many people who say, I just want to see everyone do well because it makes me be better. Is That's one of the things I love about powerlifting. So there's just no impetus to like go in there, starve yourself, and then compete. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I'm sure it's the same with all the sports. Yeah, the, right. Yeah. Well, it's like... I know it's in. It probably happens across the board. I know wrestling is notorious for bad habits in terms of weight management because weight classes matter so much. But I mean, you know what happens in running to this thought that lighter is always better, which is not the case. In my particular case, I can lose some weight. I've gotten a little flabby, but um, it's it's always tough too because then there's like the issues of body image that go into it too, you know, as athletes, like mm. I've always focused on, I want to be faster. If I look good, like that's a nice side effect, but like, that's not my primary purpose, but it's still, you know, it still seeps in, right? Like you're still, mm-hmm. you still see yourself in the mirror and you yeah. can see like building muscle and you're like, I, you know, I look better than I did before or worse or whatever you think. And, and that starts to play a factor. So I just got off on a tangent, but, no worries. Yeah, you know, just like it, weight is difficult, I think, for, for every sport. So I just didn't know, you know, if if there's a good, like, green flags, red flags, I, I suppose, in powerlifting where it's like, you know, you have somebody new. Say, say you took, like, me. Like, I'm not built like a powerlifter at all. You know, like, if I was going to do that, I assume I'd look prob- like you're over six feet tall. Well, uh, 5'10", but... Um, just there. take it and run with it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm six feet tall. Um, but I mean, I, I imagine like if I was going to be a powerlifter, I'd have to put on 20 pounds, like to, to kind of maximize my own frame. Mm-hmm. So that's what I was kind of curious about. Like, say you took me as a, a freshman in college, I weighed 142, and you're trying to get me to my, my quote unquote optimal range of like 190 or something. You yeah. know, is there is is there a progression there where it's like we, we only want you to put on five pounds every quarter or or like that kind of thing? Yes, there is because there's like a maximal rate of muscle building, muscle mass accrual that you can achieve, and okay. then otherwise you're just gonna when you put on muscle, you're also gonna put on fat, and we right. want to maximize the muscle and keep the fat as low as possible. So we'll probably like bulk and then weight and then recomp trying to like continue to build muscle and lose some of that fat and then we'll bulk again Mm -hmm. um so that would be so that would be the process for like gaining weight um so i think a lot of people who start powerlifting they're like oh this is where i am this is where i'm gonna stay and a lot of women especially that i talk to they're like i want to lean up and tone and i'm like if you're gonna be a powerlifter you're probably gonna lean up and tone but you're probably not going to go down a weight class and more than likely you're going to go up a weight class. Mm -hmm. So in the last two years, I've gone up two weight classes. I started at, it's confusing because I was in a different federation, but I started at 138 pounds and I now weigh 158 pounds. Mm -hmm. So like there was a big difference in like how much weight um, I gained and most of it's muscle mass and it's different for, most guys are going to increase weight as are the women, but I think the guys want to increase weight and the women right. are like, no, I don't want to get any bigger. Right. So, um, it's challenging to help women, um, get into powerlifting because there's all of these other social stigmas that are coloring their right. desire to be strong or big or right. whatever it is. Well, I, yeah. I kind of wanted to ask you about that a little bit. Cause like, um, I don't know if you'll share your Instagram here at the end, but yeah, um, I will. yeah. Uh, but I mean, look on your Instagram. You got plenty of photos of you. Like, like you're a good looking lady. It's not the, you. <laughs> you know, like it's, but it's like you've maximized your look, you know, it's not what I'll say like the mainstream look, but like, I think you look good because you do your thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and you own who you are. Yes. So, you know, how, how do you approach that? Since, I mean, you know, you're big into women's empowerment and you want to get more women into the sport, but obviously like I experienced this in the, in the, 
the tiniest, tiniest uh, uh, um, avenue when I worked in a shoe store and all the women that came in wanted to wear size six. Something about size six. Yeah. I don't know. Don't know why. And the, the thing is that like with shoe sizes, a full, a full shoe size is only a third of an inch. We're not talking about a very big difference, but something about that number like, mm-hmm. stuck in a lot of those women's heads. So I know there yeah. are a lot of images and ideas thrown at women about how they should look. So how, how do you approach that both on a personal level, on a coaching level, you mm-hmm. know, being in, in a sport that doesn't, you know, lend itself to kind of wafer thin <laughs> look. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know any power lifters who are wafer thin. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. We're all substantial women. So <laughs> um, personally, it just took a lot of time focusing on what my body could do over what it looked like mm-hmm. um, and just continually focusing on I can pick up 420 pounds. I'm not going to be able to be as skinny as what the like ideal American woman is supposed to look like. It's just not going to happen. Um, I also have some fantastic mentors who are women mm-hmm. um, who have showed me that like that's not what a power lifter looks like. And so I've had women that I can look up to to say like, oh, this is what a, this is what a female look can look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And she's perfectly happy and um, has no, gives no credence to what other people say she should look like or what society deems she should look like. And with my athletes, um, sometimes when they come to me, they're like, I'm really nervous about gaining weight. I'm like, okay. We can talk about that. Um, I'm not going to force feed you to eat. um, But why don't we, instead of worrying about the scale right now, let's focus on hitting these PRs. Like, this is where you're at right now. Let's focus on these numbers, these the load on the bar numbers over what the scale says. And -hmm. oftentimes that ends up helping them redirect what they want. They're like, I don't actually care what the scale says. I want to be strong. I want to be able to pick up that much weight. Um, And that's like really empowering to say, hey, I've actually changed my mind. I don't need to be skinny or have a six pack um, because I see the the changes in my body that are helping me be strong and capable and live this life. And then I have women who are like, oh, yeah, my friends asked me to help them move the other day. And I was like, that's what we want. <laughs> so you know you've made it when your friends start asking you to help move. So, yeah. But it's more, it's helping them just like refocus and reframe like on, to focus on things that are probably more important, which is living a life that brings you fulfillment and mm-hmm. focusing on, and also as a powerlifter, you get to eat a lot. So it, <laughs> that also helps. <laughs> that's um, always nice. Yeah, so focusing on things like, Go enjoy your friends and have that kind of, um, I don't like using the word balance, but give yourself the ability to go do other things and don't focus on the number on the scale. It is literally just your relation to the earth based on gravity. Right. It tells you nothing about your worth. Um, so it's challenging. And with each person, you have to approach it a little bit differently. But yeah it usually ends up in a like, look at what you can do. Not what this weird machine that humans made says. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like everybody comes with their own issues, right? It's not, it's not a matter. You know, I obviously simplified my shoe situation with everybody wants to wear a size six. It's just, that was a common trend, but, but the reasons that those women would come in and have the, you know, have those thoughts varied. Um, So it's like, but, but when you kind of come down to it, it's a matter of, you, like you said, what do you actually want? And then when you're focused on this thing, be it weight or shoe size or, or fitting into a pair of jeans you wore in high school or whatever it is, you know, what, why do you feel that way? And is it justified? And yeah. I mean that by like, say, so say somebody's, I don't know. 150 pounds and they want to be 130 do they think it's going to make them happy then they're probably not justified because it's 
probably not going to make you happy in and of itself, right? Yeah. I think there are a lot of people who say, I was happy when I was 130 pounds. I'll be happy when I'm 130 right. pounds again. And I'm like, but you're probably only remembering the good things about being 130 pounds. Right. So it's just, instead of telling people that they're wrong, like, no, you're wrong. Your weight doesn't matter. I try and like gently push them in the direction of like, hey, look at what you can do right now. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as we're in um, like the four health outcomes, there are waist circumference is a really good measure for um, later comorbidities and later issues with your health, mm -hmm. um, specifically like heart disease. And um, so there's just like this central adiposity related diseases that come with extra central adiposity. And so as long as we're like in a waist circumference range that is healthy and we aren't putting you at a higher risk for these other things, live your life the way you want to. Mm -hmm. There's, we're not going to push for this like 18% body fat that you have to have yeah. to be quote unquote happy. So and to translate that and make sure I got it right, you mean internal body fat, right? Uh, so or, centrally or, located adiposity is like adiposity that sits around your midsection that is yeah. much more likely to result in um, negative health outcomes in the future, whereas like adiposity that maybe sits around your hips or on your legs is less likely to do that. So your central adiposity. And men actually are more likely to carry their uh, weight in their stomach, yeah. and that is just more challenging um, and has a higher risk. It doesn't mean you're unhealthy now. It just means that like you have an increased risk for being unhealthy later. So as long as you're within those healthy ranges, I really don't care what your weight is. And um, I also don't care what your BMI is because for, <laughs> especially for power lifters, it's like yeah. probably the least helpful thing. So we use, right. I like to use BMI first. And if then we're getting a reading that says like, Hey, you're maybe heavy. And the, or you're maybe like increasing your health risk. Let's do this waist circumference measurement. And then we know, oh, it's either just you have a higher muscle mass than what BMI accounts for, or mm -hmm. uh, you're fine, or we need to change something. So just like, again, creating a test that lets us know yeah. exactly what's going on. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know if you got to the part in my episode with Dan and Melissa that I asked them the question I asked everybody this year. Um, if you didn't, then this would be a surprise. But if you did, then right. you'll know it's this the end. Um, nobody makes it to the end. I'm going to do <laughs> stuff with this question, though. Um, so I'm asking everybody this year, um, what do you think the purpose of sport is? That's such a good question. Give me a sec. <laughs> I think the purpose of sport is to help people find this is, I think maybe what I want the purpose of sport to be help people find what they love and find enjoyment in what they do um, and help them create lives that they can carry on for a long time and helps them be successful in other avenues. So, and connect with people and build community, community. There it is. That's what I want. I want it to be community. <laughs> Forget all the other stuff I said. It's community. <laughs> okay, I'll 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 uh, I'll mentally edit that out. If you were listening or watching, just disregard yeah, just, everything else that just, Claire said. Yeah. Go with community. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Claire. So if if people want to find you, if they want to get into powerlifting, if they want to uh, see photos of how jacked you are, um, where can they do that? So the best place to get in contact with me is probably. Either on my website, I have an email there. It's bullseyestrength.com. Um, and then my email is bullseyestrength at gmail.com. And that's B-U-L-L-Z-A-I um, strength. And then if you don't get a hold of me there, uh, my in I'm really active on Instagram. So that would be Claire underscore bullseye strength at, on Instagram. So. Sounds good. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Take care. You too.